Welcome back, students. I hope you had a good couple quarters of a while. Um, please welcome our first presenter of the day. We have Dave Verstig. He is from Starbucks, and we're really fortunate to have him on our virtual platform. He is actually the Chief Financial Officer for the International and Channel Development for Starbucks. And Dave, I believe you've been with Starbucks for nearly two decades, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we are especially fortunate as you have a lot of overseas work experience, including positions as CFO of Starbucks Japan, VP of Finance of Global Store Development, and Starbucks Reserve Roastery, and the Director of Finance for the China and Asia Pacific region. And we have a very uh, a global student demographic here, Dave, so we're very lucky to have you here. And I asked Dave before he presented, if anyone has questions or comments, you can just enter it in the chat box, and I'm just going to help Dave um, know if you guys have any of those comments. All right, Dave, I'll give it over to you. Great. Thank you, Gina. Can you see my presentation and hear me okay? I can, yes. Okay, great. Well, um, hello, everybody. And uh, as Gina said, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to all of you today. It sounds like we have a very international group and uh, international, as you'll, you'll hear, and working in different countries is really my, my passion uh, in my career. And so, very excited to talk to all of you um, and hear from you as well. If you have questions or comments along the way, please feel free to, to put them in the chat box and we'll go from there. Um, I'm gonna try to just share a little bit about my career and uh, some things I've learned along the way in hopes that it might be, might be helpful for any of you out there thinking about a career in international business. And then um, tell you a little bit about how we do things at Starbucks and uh, what our business looks like and what some of the key uh, factors for success for us have been as we've grown over the past uh, 40 years or so from a small company here in Seattle to um, to a much larger one in uh, in a number of countries around the world. So let's go from there. Um, first to introduce myself, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm based here in Seattle and uh, I did go to Business Week in, uh, in my high school career as well. So I'm an alumni of Washington Business Week. Uh, and believe it or not, it was a long time ago, but it actually gave me a lot of inspiration uh, that I've carried forward here nearly 30 years later throughout my career. So um, I'm very happy to, to meet all of you and, and know that you're getting some of that same experience this week uh, as you go through Business Week, just like I did when I, was a, when I was a high school student. So let me first just tell you a little bit about my career journey, um, which, uh, you know, which has been fairly simple, I guess. Uh, I, I grew up here in Seattle, like I said. And I think, um, you know, when I was growing up, I wouldn't describe my, uh, my neighborhood or my school as a very diverse place. Um, you know, my, uh, my upbringing was, was pretty local. Most of the, the kids I went to school with uh, looked like me and, and acted a little bit like me. And, and so um, it wasn't until I got into college uh, at the University of Washington where uh, I really started experiencing a little bit more uh, in terms of diversity of lifestyles of my friends and different backgrounds that people had, um, had come from. Uh, and, and that's something I've continued to explore and, and been fortunate enough to, uh, to continue to, uh, to experience as I've gone through my career. Uh, I went to University of Washington here in Seattle, went to the business school and got an accounting degree, uh, studied accounting and became a certified public accountant here in the U.S., uh, which for me was a very good foundation for a business career. It was just a a great place to, um, to learn what we call the language of business. Uh, and it's been something that uh, as I've gotten further in my career, I've gotten away from the accounting side, but it was a great foundation for me to, uh, to start a number of different things. Out of college, I went to work at Deloitte. Uh, at the time, I was Deloitte and Touche. I was an auditor uh, working again in the accounting field and spent about four or five years uh, at Deloitte. And again, a great place to to start my career, met a lot of very interesting people. Um, I really enjoyed working with a lot of different companies uh, at Deloitte or other big consulting firms. You have a great experience of getting to work with clients. So every few weeks you're moving around from one company to the next and uh, really learning a lot, of, uh, a lot of diverse industries as you go. Uh, while at Deloitte, Starbucks was actually one of my clients. And so that's how I got to know Starbucks. Uh, um, long ago as I, was, uh, as I was working on that account and, and they were a client of mine uh, for a couple of months per year. I really fell in love with the company and fell in love with what we were, what we were doing, the people there, uh, you know, just the simple idea of trying to serve a, a nice cup of coffee to our customers 
And so I went to work for Starbucks uh, a number of years ago and have, have been there now almost 16 years uh, growing up through the finance department. So that's a little bit about where I've been uh, in my career. And again, not, not too many different stops, but uh, each one has kind of helped me advance to the next spot. So I want to tell you a little bit, little bit about my um, international journey. And as we, as we do that, I'd like you to just kind of reflect, um, reflect on this question. What's the most interesting place you've ever visited and why? What's the most interesting place you've ever visited and why? And if you have any, um, anything you want to share, please feel free to share it in the, in the chat box and, uh, and you know if you have any interesting, interesting stories of places you visited. Um, and before we go on, does anybody know what this picture is of? Anybody out there know what this picture, where this picture was taken or what it, what it is showing? We have uh, coffee beans. Yeah, yes, this is a, Southeast Asia. That's right. This is this is a picture of a coffee farm. Um, I believe it's probably in Central America. Uh, but at Starbucks, you know, we have a we have a bit of an inside joke. Um, a lot of people don't know where coffee comes from, uh, even though even those people that work at Starbucks uh, and uh, and the joke is that coffee grows on trees, like many other things. Um, coffee does grow on trees, and this is a picture of. Uh, a woman tending to some coffee trees uh, on a farm in Central America. And uh, coffee grows uh, on a tree that sort of resembles a cherry tree. And um, farmers will pick the cherries off of the trees uh, during the coffee harvest in the fall. And the pit of those cherries becomes uh, what we know as a coffee bean. It takes a long journey to go from, uh, from the farm to your coffee cup, but um, after picking a cherry, uh, the, the pit of the cherry will be extracted and, and roasted eventually. And that's what turns into the cup of coffee or the coffee that we grind and put into our cup. So this is a beautiful coffee farm uh, in Central America. So let me, um, let me spend a few minutes on my, uh, my international journey. And um, it really started when I was in, uh, in high school and college. Uh, and I, I took my first uh, trips outside of North America and traveled a little bit around Europe. And I think we have some um, some students from Europe uh, actually on the on the call today. And so, um, you know, for you, uh, travel in Europe is maybe not necessarily as, as as exotic as it was for me when I was in in high school and college. But for the first time, I really um, explored some areas that uh, you know I don't, I'd only read about in books and uh, was able to really see. Uh, Things like in this picture, the Parthenon in Greece, where I had uh, I had studied uh, mythology and, and Greek history uh, throughout my my high school and college uh, history lessons, and for the first time I got to see that in person. And I can still remember uh, looking up in Athens at, at the hillside and seeing the Parthenon, and just the the sense of awe that that brought to me, and really helped me kind of open up and understand uh, what it meant to see different cultures and, and different pieces of uh, of history and and really human, the human experience. The next stop was uh, moving up, up the screen, uh, was in a little country called East Timor in, uh, in Southeast Asia near Indonesia. And uh, about 20 years ago, a friend of mine was living in East Timor. And at the time it was uh, the poorest country in the world. It was a, a newly independent country that had just gained independence from Indonesia and uh, was primarily a coffee farming country. And so for, for me working at Starbucks, it was very interesting to see how coffee farmers lived, what their lifestyle was like. Uh, and in this case, uh, as I mentioned, the, the poorest country in the world, people living on sometimes a dollar per day uh, and, and, and supporting their family on that. And, uh, you know, it was very interesting, also very inspirational just to, again, experience a totally different way of life. Um, a, a different country, um, you know, a different uh, a, a farming lifestyle, and to see just how uh, how people lived in, in that situation and how um, how happy they were. You know, no, nobody really cared about their economic situation. Um, they didn't care about how much money they had. It was just uh, really about supporting your family and, and being being happy uh, with the situation that they were in. So very inspirational too. 
uh, to spend some time in East Timor. Then as I got into, into my role at Starbucks, uh, I was able to um, have the opportunity to go over to Germany and spent about three months living in Essen, Germany. And it was really my first uh, international assignment as part of my career. And uh, what I've loved about the places I've been around the world is that each of them is so different from the others. And I think, you know, in Germany, um, it wasn't uh, a culture that was too different from what I was used to as an American, but at the same time, had a lot of uh, very unique qualities. And I learned a lot living in Germany uh, and, and working with uh, my German colleagues. Um, you know, uh, I think my impression was that um, my colleagues there were very extremely direct and didn't, didn't hold back on, uh, on how they felt or, or what they thought, especially compared to some other countries I've worked in. Uh, a very direct, uh, direct approach and, um, you know, they let you know what they were thinking and, and got to the point as, as quickly as they could. From there, um, I, I, I uh, came back to the U.S. and then a few years later had the opportunity to uh, to work in China in our Shanghai office for about a year. And China was one of the more fascinating places that um, that I've been to and, uh, and um, you know, really, really taught me a lot about a lot of different things. Um, for, for me, um, you know, the culture of China was one that was very, uh, what I call pragmatic and very, uh, very oriented toward growth and speed. Uh, and even today in our Shanghai office, the China team is known as the fastest moving uh, around Starbucks. We're opening uh, hundreds of stores up to 500, 600 stores per year in China. Uh, we have about 5,000 stores there today or we'll soon have 5,000 stores there. Um, and, and in China, um, not only Starbucks, but a lot of the business culture is just going as quickly as they can. It's a very fast moving place. Um, and, and what I call very pragmatic, they'll do anything they can to, uh, to grow as quickly as they can and, uh, and try to improve the business as quickly as they can. And then finally, more recently, I was able to spend some time uh, in, in Japan. I spent, uh, about the past three years working in our Tokyo office in Japan with Starbucks. Uh, my family and I just returned uh, earlier this year after three years living in Tokyo. Um, and Japan was probably the most, most interesting of the bunch. Uh, and again, what's so fascinating about it is how different uh, a country like Japan is from a country like China. Uh, Japan is uh, in contrast to China, you know, very quick and, and fast paced. Japan is very slow paced and deliberate, uh, very cautious. Um, Japanese business people do not like to take risk. Uh, and they don't like to uh, place bets on growth. They don't like to grow too quickly. Uh, and so to, to compare and contrast the two different cultures uh, was very interesting. Uh, and for me, Japan was actually a bit of a, a bit of a struggle because of that cautiousness. Um, at Starbucks, I've grown up, you know, for the past 16 years, growing very quickly and uh, very fast paced business. And uh, to come to Japan where the pace was a little slower was, uh, was an interesting adjustment for me. Uh, but, but I really liked the experience and really enjoyed living there for a few years. Um, so let me stop there real quickly. And, and Gene, I don't know if we have any comments or questions yet, but let's just pause and see if, see if we do. Yeah, there's a lot of people saying their most interesting place. We have Costa Rica, we have Japan, um, China, uh, Singapore, places that the students have traveled. Good. So some of the places I'm even mentioning. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Costa Rica, I don't know if anybody's been to um, any coffee farms there, but Starbucks actually sources a lot of coffee. And we, uh, we own a farm in Costa Rica where we do a lot of research on coffee growing and uh, and farming techniques and, uh, and the field of agronomy. So Costa Rica is a very near and dear place uh, to, to my, my working life as well. Okay, so um, before I get into uh, the Starbucks side of things, you know, let me just talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the key success factors that have really helped me as I've gone through, um, you know, gone through almost 15 years of, of international work. Number one is to keep an open mind and seek to understand others' point of view. 
Um, what's great about working in different countries and, and for many of you, you know, uh, probably experiencing uh, and, and, and studying or working with people in different countries is that everybody has a different point of view and uh, they have a different background and a different upbringing. And so keeping an open mind for me has probably been uh, the most critical element of trying to be successful in an international uh, business setting. Really being a good listener, seeking to understand uh, that point of view that other people are bringing to the conversation. Um, you know, for example, in China, uh, our store development team, our real estate team's point of view is to grow as quickly as they can. Uh, in Japan, their point of view is to grow probably much more slowly at a, at a more measured pace. And so you have to be able to navigate those two conversations and, and seek to understand where, the, where they're coming from with very different points of view. Second is that communication is very critical, uh, including language and culture. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but people uh, ask me, you know, what can I do to, um, to help kickstart a career? And I, I think language is a, is a big one. Um, here in the United States, we're not that great about learning foreign languages. Uh, definitely not as great as, uh, as, uh, as students in, uh, in other countries. Uh, you know, I've met um, people, in, uh, people from uh, the Netherlands, students from the Netherlands or coworkers from the Netherlands that speak five or six languages. Uh, and I'm sure many of you on the line speak many different languages, but uh, I think uh, learning different languages is definitely a, a critical foundation piece for, uh, for a career in international, businesses, in international business. And culture as well, as I mentioned, trying to understand others' point of view and, and, and learn where they're coming from comes with an understanding of culture. And then finally, relationships, relationships, relationships. Relationships are extremely important, um, not only in helping you be successful in other cultures, but in finding opportunities to, uh, to work in different places. And so investing the time in getting to know people, um, getting to, to, to uh, develop a close relationship with, uh, with your colleagues and coworkers, whether they be in your home office or in, uh, in, in, in foreign countries is extremely important. Again, um, in the US culturally, we don't necessarily have um, a deep view on relationships with our, our coworkers. You know, for many people in the US, uh, work is work and home is home. And so those relationships can be very separate. Not everybody, but in general, um, you know, a lot of people uh, function that way. But in other cultures, uh, like in Japan, your coworkers are like your family and those relationships are, are extremely important. And so it's, uh, it's very important to spend the time to develop them in addition to the work that you're doing uh, on a daily basis. Okay, so let me, um, let me again stop there and just see if there's any, any questions or comments out there so far before we get into the Starbucks side of things. You definitely touched on this. Is there anything you've done personally to adapt to different uh, cultures and different places? And do you have a different approach depending on where you go? Yeah, um, you know, I think um, there's a couple of things, uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned a couple of them, but one, one is just the language. I always try to learn a little bit of language. Um, so I, um, I did take German when I was in high school and uh, that was what kickstarted my my career and, and moving to Germany was I spoke a little bit of German, um, by no means fluent, but you know, uh, grade school level. And then as I uh, had assignments in China and Japan, uh, one of the first things I did was try to learn a little bit of the language before I actually went there. And uh, for me, that's always been very helpful. Uh, people you meet are incredibly appreciative of the effort uh, that you're that you're putting in. Uh, they they feel like you're really invested in, in the time there. Uh, and then in addition, obviously you can, you can talk to people just at a different level other than, you know, speaking English or, uh, or using a translator. So it's, uh, it's been very helpful for many different ways. Um, yeah. And then, you know, secondly, um, it's kind of a funny, funny thing, but food is extremely important to, uh, to many cultures, probably to every culture. And uh, I always find that food and, and eating and um, you know, sharing with people what are the foods that you've tried or what are your favorite foods in different countries is a, is a good way to, uh, to get to know people and to really um, help you understand each other. So it's a, it's a showing of effort, but also a great way to connect with people over, over food and talking about local, local cuisine. 
Great question. We had a few more for you, Dave, before you move on. Um, is, there sort, is there any sort of governmental control over corporations, let's say in China, and how does Starbucks handle that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, in today's, um, in today's uh, what I'd call geopolitical climate, um, that's becoming a, an, even, uh, an even stronger question as, uh, you know, economic relationships between the U.S. and China in particular um, become more and more strained. And with the election coming up um, in, in the U.S., you know, never really sure what, what those economic ties and relationships are going to look like from a day-to-day um, -day or month-to-month -month basis. So, um, you know, at Starbucks, we have tried to do a couple of things um, in China in particular. Uh, number one, we've tried to build a very local company. And so uh, we have a, a phrase we say, uh, in China, for China. And that, that kind of guides what we do. We, um, we hire all of our, or, or most of our employees in China. Um, we develop product for the Chinese customer that may be very different from, uh, from a U.S. customer. And so we've tried to take a very local approach, uh, not only to China, but to most markets that we're in, and really, um, really become a Chinese company as opposed to an American or multinational company. Uh, in the eyes of our customers and, and in the eyes of our brand uh, and in the eyes of, uh, of the Chinese government, both local and national. And then secondly, we do invest a lot in our, what we call our government relations uh, department. We have uh, a, lot of our, uh, a lot of our staff is dedicated toward uh, maintaining positive relations with, uh, you know, not only the Chinese government, but in many countries that we do business. And, and it's very important uh, when you're doing things like uh, you know, serving food that's subject to uh, food safety rules or opening stores that are subject to local zoning and development rules. Uh, it's important to put some resource and effort into maintaining good relations with, uh, with local government authorities. So, um, you know, there are, in terms of restrictions, there are, uh, there are some logistical restrictions. You know, it's difficult to, for example, difficult to move money between China and the U.S., um, difficult for us to to do what we call repatriate our profits from China into the U.S. and things like that. Um, but for the most part, we operate very similar to how we would in, in other countries. It's a great question. All right. The questions are definitely coming in now. And we have a lot of students here from the country of Georgia. Mm -hmm. and they're wondering when they will get a Starbucks. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. You know, I'm, I'm excited. I've never been to Georgia, so really excited that you guys are on the line and uh, that we have a chance to, to interact a little bit. Um, you know, we are, let me just fast forward a couple, uh, a couple slides here, if I can, while, while I'm talking about this. So today we're in, uh, we're in 81 markets around the world, and you can see, um, you know, we're in, we're in a, lot of, a lot of places and continually looking to expand. So, I can't give you an answer on when we'll be in, in Georgia, but I, I would imagine it will be sooner rather than later. So, so hang tight. I'm, I'm glad that you appreciate the Starbucks brand and hope we can get a store there pretty soon. All right. And then what is the biggest difference between the customers you've seen in each, each country? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, let, me, let me come back to that one, Gina. I'll come back to that one in a minute because I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. And this might also tie into that. Why is the American menu so various compared to the European menus? Yeah, I'll come. I'll come back to that too. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me continue down the Starbucks line, and then we'll come back to come back to those questions. Okay. Okay. So uh, first, a, a very simple question for you: As we talk about Starbucks and our international business, uh, why do companies go international? And the answer is very easy. It's, you know, it's D, all of the above, plus many more. But, but for us, um, you know, I think probably the three most compelling, compelling reasons are, um, number one, to grow with new customers and new markets. Uh, I, I showed you that slide just a second ago. We're in now in 81 countries. And so it allows us to reach a lot more customers and, uh, and bring our stores into a, a, lot more, um, a lot more markets around the world. Second one is to find new products and supply chains, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but uh, you know, Starbucks, as you can imagine, uh, is looking for 
uh, product and looking for things to buy all over the world. We buy coffee from, uh, you know, from farmers, as I talked about earlier, in, uh, in coffee growing regions in Africa and Central America and Asia. Um, we buy a lot of furniture. Uh, you know, our store environment is, is incredibly important in our business. So we buy a lot of furniture uh, and we're looking for new places to buy high quality furniture. Um, and then we buy a lot of milk. You know, Starbucks, Starbucks has a very varied product, uh, product platform. And so we're always looking for new sources of, uh, of product in our supply chain. And then C, to protect our brand and business. And that's been very important as we've grown up as well. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, we've seen a lot of copycats uh, in, uh, in our business where um, people will open up a coffee shop in a certain country. I mean, I'm sure in Georgia you have, uh, you have sort of uh, Starbucks-like businesses, Italian-style coffee bars. You probably have a, a long coffee history as well. And so uh, for us, it's been very important to, uh, to open in certain countries um, quickly before somebody else can and, and become the Starbucks of, you know, of that country. Um, in India, for example, it took us a, a long time to open our first store in India, which we did in 2014. Uh, and as you can imagine, there are, there are a number of local competitors in India that have hundreds of stores, uh, and they call themselves the Starbucks of India. So we are, uh, we're now there, but, but having to play catch up. And so for us, it's very important to, to open and protect the business. Um, Back to our, our international presence. Um, so we are in 81 markets today uh, with over 17,000 stores outside of the United States. And, uh, and you can see how that breaks down in terms of our store count um, by country. And uh, the colors on the map represent how we go to market with our business structure, uh, which for me is a very interesting part of my role. But in green, we have uh, what we call company owned markets. Starbucks owns all of the stores in that market uh, and owns 100% of the stores. So markets like China, the US, Canada, the UK, uh, and Japan, uh, large markets where we've decided that we want to have ownership of the entire business and own all of our stores. We have a couple of markets that are in blue where we've done uh, a joint venture, a 50-50 joint venture with a local company, um, primarily seen in India and South Korea. India, as I mentioned, is relatively new, but South Korea, we have 1,400 stores. And in those markets, we decided to partner with a local company and go 50-50 on a joint venture. Uh, it allows us to, to still have a Starbucks brand and Starbucks store presence, but it allows us to leverage and, and partner with somebody who knows the local market much better than we might. Um, that's important because in our business, you know, there's, there's coffee, but there's also some very important things like real estate, uh, knowing where to open your stores, where the customers are. And then there's also local hiring and, and labor practices. Uh, we, we hire a lot of people to work in our stores and it's very important to know the ins and outs of those kinds of things. So, so sometimes we'll partner with business, with other businesses. And then in yellow is where we have um, done what's called a licensing agreement. And we will, uh, again, work with a local company and we will license our brand to that company uh, to run our stores on our behalf. So um, in Mexico, for example, and uh, in France, we work with a partner called Alsea. Uh, across those two countries and they open Starbucks stores uh, and they, to, to you and I, they look exactly like any other Starbucks would, but they're actually owned and operated by, uh, by a different company. And uh, they pay us a royalty in, in, uh, in honor of that for the ability to own and operate Starbucks stores. So very unique structures and an interesting way of, of going to market across these countries. And so we talked about this, but when you look at Starbucks growth aspirations, um, we've publicly said that we want to grow our store count, our unit growth, our store growth globally by 6% to 7% per year. And in the U.S., that growth rate is about 3 to 4% per year. So we may open a few hundred stores every year in the United States, 
And so in order to, um, in order to really reach that six to 7% goal, we're growing much more quickly in other countries. Uh, I mentioned China earlier, but China, we're growing our stores by about 15% per year. So much more quickly than in the U S and that allows us to maintain a growth rate that's higher than what we could do by just staying in the United States alone. Really our overall growth strategy. Okay, so let's get to some of the questions that we talked about earlier and, and talk about our customers and products in other countries. So first of all, a trivia question for you. What is the most popular Starbucks drink in Japan? You guys can shout out some answers in the chat box. Let's see, let's, let's just take a couple minutes and see what gets the most answers. We have D, C, lots of Ds. Um, mainly just D. Mainly D, okay, yeah. So, so D, the matcha green tea latte, is actually a drink that has become a, a global favorite, but it started in Japan a number of years ago. And, uh, you know, as most of you probably know and can recognize matcha and, and green tea has a strong tradition and actually, as it turns out, is a very delicious flavor that uh, has become very popular in, in our Western markets as well. Um, but the answer is actually A, the strawberry frappuccino. Um, strawberry frappuccino is, is by far the most popular drink in Japan. And actually, it's one of the most, if not the, uh, one of the most popular drinks that we have around the world. Uh, our Japanese customers uh, actually, you know, they just go crazy for strawberry frappuccino when it's available. We do about a, a three week promotion per year in the spring and uh, we sell a lot of strawberry frappuccinos uh, and, and Japanese customers love it. I think you can also see dragon fruit refresher. Uh, I don't know if we have that one in, in our European markets yet, um, but that's another uh, flavor from Asia that has made its way into the U.S. and has become a very, very popular summer drink uh, this summer here in, in Seattle and around, around the West Coast, too. So um, the point of this question is to really talk about, uh, you know, one of our key strategic pushes in our international business is to develop a lot of what we call locally relevant drinks. Um, and so as you go around the world, you'll see many, many different kinds of drinks at different Starbucks stores uh, in different countries. There's a selection of them here, um, but we have, uh, you know, banana frappuccino, cantaloupe frappuccino. We have strawberry, as I mentioned. Uh, in Japan, we did one called the American Cherry Pie Frappuccino. It actually had a little pie crust on top. Uh, in the middle there is a, a cloud tea latte with a cloud of uh, cotton candy on top of it. And so um, some of the questions were around our, our drinks in different markets, but we really try to develop uh, almost country by country or region by region uh, a selection of beverages that's very relevant for, um, for the local, local customer. Um, and as I mentioned earlier with China, that's really helped us, uh, helped us stay locally relevant, you know, almost hopefully to our customers' minds, not be a, a big American brand, but more of a locally relevant company that, uh, that develops products that, that people like in those countries. Now, the question to why the, uh, why the drinks were so much different in the U.S. or, or such a better variety or different variety in the U.S. than in Europe um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why that is, but I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take that one away and see if I can see if I can figure out what's going on there because we should be we should be rolling out new things and innovating and you know what we what we call surprising and delighting our customers uh, with with new drinks. You know, almost anywhere we are. The next piece um, that we, we focus a lot on is around locally relevant stores and store design. And, um, you know, for us, the coffee and our drinks are very important. Um, the people in our stores are very important. Uh, you know, it's very important that you as a customer have a positive interaction with, with our store employees, with our baristas. And then the store environment and the physical space is also extremely important. And so um, not only do we try to design our stores with a high level of design focus, but we try to make them very locally relevant. And here are a couple photos of some of my favorite stores around the world. Um, 
down in the lower left is uh, a store in Japan. Uh, it's in a city called Kawagoe, and it's designed to look like a, a traditional Japanese uh, shop or customs house, uh, almost like a tea house, designed with very local principles in mind. Uh, in the upper left is our roastery in Milan. We, uh, we opened a roastery a few years ago in the former post office in central Milan. It's a beautiful, huge store um, with, uh, you know, just a, a roasting facility and a lot going on in it. Um, upper middle store is also in Japan. It's uh, by a famous Japanese architect named Kengo Kuma uh, down in southern Japan. And he, as you can see, designs with a lot of wood and uh, developed this store in partnership with us uh, a number of years ago uh, to highlight Japanese design and architecture. And then in the upper right is um, the pink store, we call it. That's one of the only, if not the only, pink Starbucks in the world. And it's our first store in, uh, in what's called the Turks and Caicos, some islands in the Caribbean uh, off, the, off the eastern uh, U.S. And so um, in addition to our people and our, our product, our beverages, the store environment and the store look and feel is incredibly important to, uh, to how we do things at Starbucks around the world. Okay, so let me, um, let me stop there again, um, Gina, and just see if there's any other questions or comments out there. Yeah, a lots of people are saying their favorite drinks. We have a cookie crumble, dragon fruit drink, um, just black coffee, uh, ice caramel macchiato. And we had one question, um, and, and it kind of um, alluded to this. How important is it for businesses to appeal or make their customers happy? Yeah, it's, it's number one. I mean, it's, it's job number one, um, I think, of any business. But for us, you know, um, there are a number of reasons why uh, it's so incredibly important. Um, you know, we, we, say, uh, we say a lot at Starbucks that, uh, you know, we're a coffee company. Um, but we are not really in the coffee business. We're in the people business. Uh, and we're in the people business serving coffee. And so um, when you come to our store as a customer, like I said earlier, we, we actually first and foremost want you to have a really good experience uh, with, with our baristas, with the people that work in our stores um, and, and have a really positive interaction. Um, our mission statement says that, that our mission is to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person and one cup and one neighborhood at a time. And so uh, we place a lot of emphasis on that question, which is, which is really making our customers happy and, and really exceeding their expectations. Um, but, you know, in a, in a world of, uh, in a world, more general world of competitive businesses, I think keeping your customers happy is, is your number one priority. And that's what's going to keep them uh, coming back, keep them choosing your company instead of choosing someone else's. All right, one more question for you. Why, why is it more important to have a joint venture with some countries compared to others? Yeah, that's a really great, really good question. Um, and for Starbucks, you know, what you, what you didn't see on that map was that um, for, for us, most of the time when we opened in a new country, we would actually start with a joint venture. Um, and that's because, you know, for us as a, as a company based in Seattle, uh, we're familiar with practices in the US, but you know, when we start expanding to countries like China and India, you know, somebody asked earlier about government regulations in China. Um, and the, and there, are, there are a lot, you know, it's a very different place to do business than in Europe or, or in the United States. And so, um, it's important to, first of all, understand whether you think you know enough about that country to, um, to be able to do business there. Uh, and it's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just selling product, but it's understanding what do your customers want, what's important to them. Uh, it's understanding the real estate landscape and, you know, how do leases work and how do you, how do you know when certain sites come open that you might want to open a store? And then it's, uh, it's about knowing how to hire people and, and how to hire the right people for your stores. For us, those are the three, the three most important areas. And so if we don't feel that we know enough about a country uh, and in those three areas, we will partner with somebody uh, to open the store there. 
And that no. kind of ties into the, the next question someone yeah. had. Um, how do you keep your employees happy and retained at Starbucks? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, uh, again, you know, sort of going above and beyond just the, the, the daily routine of coffee, right? So I mentioned our, our mission statement um, for Starbucks, you know, for myself and many of our employees, uh, our company's mission is very, very important to, to them staying with the company. So, um, you know, I mentioned, our, I mentioned our mission statement to inspire and nurture the human spirit. And beneath that, there's a lot, you know, a lot going on. Um, we want, when people come into our stores as a customer, we want them to have a positive experience and we do a lot to, to make sure that happens. Um, we do a lot to make sure that our coffee farmers that we buy coffee from are getting a fair price and are doing business in a sustainable way for them and for the environment. Um, and so I think our biggest differentiator from a, you know, from a retention uh, perspective is really the mission and values of the company and and people wanting to be a part of something bigger than just going to work every day um, you know there are other things in, in the Seattle market uh, where most of our our non-store employees are you know there's a lot of big companies here there's Amazon and Microsoft and um, a lot of big tech some of the world's largest companies in terms of market value uh, paying a lot of big salaries. And so it's very important for us to, uh, to be competitive in that environment. And I think the, the company's mission and values play a big part of that. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I know the South Korean Starbucks is a joint venture. What is the biggest difference between doing business with South Korea and the U S? Yeah, I think, um, a couple, a couple observations, maybe these are more observations than anything, but the South Korean market is, first of all, extremely competitive, and it's probably the most competitive market that we are in. Um, if you go to Seoul, Korea, or Busan, or, or other large cities, you might see five or six coffee shops on each corner. And, you know, they're all different brands. Uh, most of them are local brands. And so, um, it's a it's an extremely competitive place where we have to be constantly innovating and and thinking of new things that our customers want to see. Could be products. It could be um, you know using your smartphone in a different way. It could be digital technology and interacting with customers in a in a digital way instead of a physical way. Uh, but the biggest difference for me in, in South Korea is the uh, the competitiveness of the market and just how many different coffee shops there are there. Okay, well, Gina, maybe I'll maybe I'll just wrap up with um, a couple of thoughts here, and then we can then we can take any other questions as we have time. That's good. So, you know, just to just to wrap up um, again, I really appreciate you guys listening to me for for an hour. Um, if if there are some of you out there who are interested in a, a career in international business and wondering, you know, what you can do. First of all, like I said, Business Week for me was a great inspiration in my overall business career, and so. Um, believe it or not, you know, what you're doing this week could be very important to you down the road. And, and uh, I'm really glad you're all, you're all here going through this program. But outside of that, um, you know, there are a few, a few big things that I've talked about some of them, but um, the first thing is to develop a global mindset. And again, in, it, this could be different from country to country. In the United States, we don't necessarily do a good job of developing a global mindset among uh, among students and young people. And so uh, you sometimes have to go above and beyond and do things a little different. We tend to be very focused on what's happening in, in the US or what's happening in our own city. Um, but it's important to do a lot of reading. Um, there's a lot of resources out there, but just help you develop a global mindset and understand what's going on in other countries. Uh, second is to travel and get outside your comfort zone. It's a little bit hard to do right now. and um, for me, as an international business person, it's, it's uh, difficult not being able to travel uh, for, for quite some time. But as I mentioned, for me, travel has been a huge growth opportunity, and I've learned a lot. We talked about learning a foreign language. Language is always a key connection point for, for traveling in any country. And then finally, make an effort to meet new and interesting people who are different from you. Um, you know, again, really understanding other people's point of view 
and understanding uh, what they're saying and where they're coming from. It may be different from where you're coming from, but the fun is in really uh, recognizing and trying to understand uh, what other people are bringing to the conversation and, and how their background is, is influencing your interactions. So just encourage you to think about those few things and, uh, and go from there. And, and I'm happy to take other questions if we have time. And thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you so much, David. We're actually sadly out of time, um, but thank you. The so like tons of great questions. The students want to learn so much from you. So we really value you being here. All right, everyone, you're going to go back to company meeting six to finish while quarter six. All right. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Thanks, David.